Welcome to this lesson on blending technology in tutoring and mentoring. I'm Angelica Kramer, the director of the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. What we want to talk about today in this lesson is first to define what best practices in tutoring and mentoring are in general. And then we will discuss what the role of technology can play within tutoring and mentoring. So how do we go about blending this? We then move on to a couple of uh, tips on effective tutoring and mentoring, some of the hallmarks. And then we will round out our lesson by discussing some resources and platforms that lend themselves well for blending technology and when we talk about tutoring and mentoring. So before we start diving in here, let's think about some definitions. What's the difference between tutoring and mentoring? Merriam-Webster defines a tutor as a person charged with the instruction and guidance of another, such as a private teacher. So that's the context that we are working in. In comparison to that, a mentor, according to Merriam-Webster, is a trusted counselor or a guide, or also something like a tutor and a coach. When we think about best practices in tutoring and mentoring in general, one of the resources that oftentimes gets cited is Sinclair, and he defined the seven golden rules of tutoring and mentoring schemes. And they are number one, to define your aims, to structure the content, to define the roles of the individuals that are involved in tutoring and mentoring, to train both the tutors and the mentors, then to support the tutors and the mentors, to keep logistics as simple as possible. And the seventh golden rule is to evaluate the scheme. So thinking about, are these six prior steps actually working? Does anything need to be adjusted? Now, some people argue what is missing from the seven golden rule is actually an eighth rule. That is to increase the ownership of the person who is being tutored or mentored over time. So moving away from just focusing on the people who's giving the advice on the, the teacher role to include the person um, who is at the learning end here as well. Here's a, a brief comparison between tutoring and mentoring. So what we see from the definitions in Merriam-Webster Tutor and mentor have some overlap here, but really the main difference is the focus area. For a tutor, we oftentimes think about just the academic area, the academic learning, whereas mentoring is really a, a longer process where we focus on life skills or professional skills. Many times in a tutoring setting, we think about one tutor and possibly multiple students. In the context of the language flagship, of course, tutoring generally takes place between one tutor and one T. And mentoring generally tends to be, the mode tends to be one to one. And then for the duration, oftentimes tutoring is a shorter term process. If you think about regular language classes, tutoring oftentimes is restricted to one semester. Again, in the flagship context, um, tutoring generally takes place over the course of the student's lifetime in the flagship, whereas mentoring is a more longer term process, again, tying to really honing life skills and professional skills, which generally takes a little bit longer um, to impart. When we think about the role of technology in what are we talking about? Blending technology for tutoring and mentoring. Great. When we think about the role of technology in tutoring and mentoring, we first need to define what we mean when we talk about technology. One of the things that oftentimes comes to mind first these days is technology means using a computer and using the internet. And of course, many of our students have tablets, they have cell phones, they have smartwatches that they can use not only for learning, but also the extension when we talk about tutoring and mentoring. And of course, not only our students use these tools, but we as educators use them as well. 
sometimes what we tend to forget is that there are other types of technologies that we can use. Let's not forget whiteboards or simply the act of writing something. And that certainly can be writing online, but also maybe writing just on a sheet of paper. Um, TV is another form of technology or anything that is visual. Of course, also anything that is auditory. Audio files can be technology. And I also would venture to say that just sometimes meeting over a cup of coffee can be a way to engage and can be quote unquote a technology. So we shouldn't only think about technology as anything that's available online. So now that we have defined the types of technologies that are at our disposal when we think about how we can blend technology in our pursuit of tutoring and mentoring, let's also talk about the important role that technology plays in overcoming boundaries. So when we utilize technology for not only tutoring and mentoring, but actually also for our teaching in general, we have much more flexibility in terms of time, space, and pace. So sometimes when we try to connect with a native speaker who lives in a different country, in a different continent, in a different time zone, it makes it complicated to touch base with that person in a synchronous manner at the same time. So technology allows us to connect with people in an asynchronous way where maybe we leave certain commentaries on a shared document for the person that we're working with when we tutor or when we mentor, or we can leave video messages so it's not only restricted to the written word, but they can also listen to our messages at a later point in time. Also technology allows us to listen or read many times, repeated times, and it also can change the pace. Sometimes, say we do leave um, a video for the person that we're tutoring, and they can listen to it at half the speed if we're speaking a little bit too quickly. So many different opportunities that really can help us overcome boundaries. And also I made a note here of um, physical and mental boundaries. Sometimes we need to think about that we want to be all inclusive in our um, tutoring and mentoring practices and technology can help with those boundaries as well. Or when you think about sometimes maybe the first time you're meeting with somebody to tutor them or to mentor them and you don't know the person very well, how do you start engaging with a stranger? that can be a little bit tricky when you do that face to face. So sometimes technology can take away some of those possibly mental discomforts or fears um, at first. Technology can also help us, of course, connect with the target language and culture. And in our context here of um, thinking about language teaching, cultural teaching, mentoring, tutoring, Really, the, the internet here in this case has a lot of possibilities and opens up lots of opportunities for our students. We can provide them with broader exposure to different native speakers of different ages, of different genders, of different regions. So while you might be a tutor or you, while you might be training a tutor, and they are the one person that one of our students is engaging with over a longer period of time, there are still opportunities that we can tap into to expose the students to the diversity of people that they would communicate with, say, when they study abroad. Also, of course, um, online, we have a lot of access to um, different artifacts from the target culture, different realia. And there are a plethora of online sites that can help us provide um, more opportunities, more options, um, to, to practice more with the target language, to engage more with the target culture. And one example is Forvo, um, which is an online dictionary. So if our, um, if our students want to hear how words are pronounced, for example, that is one online resource. And of course, there are so many um, that we can use, but we want to focus on tutoring and mentoring. So we'll leave it at this one specific um, 
culturally authentic resource here. Another important piece that we have to discuss when we think about the role of technology in tutoring and mentoring is the notion of backward design. So this was first defined by Wiggins and McTie in 1998. And really, just like when we implement technology for teaching, we need to start by thinking about our goals. What do we want the people that we're working with in our context, the, the students that we tutor, or the students or colleagues that we mentor, what do we want them to be able to do at the end of our time with them? So we need to identify the results and our learning goals. And then from there, we plan backwards. So what do we need to do to get our students to this goal eventually? And what is the role of technology? How can technology really help us get the people we're working with to that point? So again, the technology should always support our goals and objectives and should never be the goal or the objective in and of itself. So we shouldn't utilize technology only for the sake of using it because maybe there is a new tool that we find fascinating and that we want to use in our tutoring and mentoring practice, but we really always have to put the objective and the goal first. So now, how can we make tutoring and mentoring effective? We've defined what a tutor is, what a mentor is, some of the golden rules for tutoring and mentoring, and the role that technology can play. When we think about effective tutoring and mentoring, one of the things we need to think about are the stakeholders. Who are the people who um, we are working with? This can take many different shapes depending on our context. We've already talked about tutoring sometimes being one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes being one on several. Mentoring can take place among two students. Mentoring can take place among ourselves and, other, and another colleague. Mentoring can take place between a faculty member and a student. So just as you think about what makes tutoring effective, first think about the stakeholders. Next, think about your goals and objectives. What exactly do you want to accomplish at the end of the time with the person or the people that you're working with? And then think about scheduling as well. Where are you? Are, are you in the same context as uh, the person that you're working with? Will you be connecting exclusively online? Think about time zones, think about some of the obstacles that you may need to overcome if you're not in the same location at the same time. Then also think about the resources that you have at your disposal. So again, going back to what types of technologies are available, will you be connecting online? Is there a possibility for you to possibly connect in person as well, just sitting down over a cup of coffee to talk face to face that way? What other resources will you be using to um, broaden the, the experience that you have? And then lastly, think about potential obstacles. So again, we already talked about time zones being a possible um, obstacle. Access to technology. If technology is the sole means for you to connect or for the, the people who are engaged in tutoring to connect, Think about what would happen if there is a glitch in technology or maybe if somebody is um, in a location at a given point in time where there is not a stable internet connection. So just think about different things that could happen and how you would work around it and how you would help the people that you are working with in dealing with any of these obstacles um, that they might encounter. Now, we talked about stakeholders being important, right? And the number one thing in establishing effective tutoring and mentoring relationships is thinking about how to build relationships with the people. So you want to make sure that you personalize the experience, that you also incorporate the interests of the person that you're working with, that you support their strengths, and also that you continuously communicate and collaborate. So think about if you are the mentor and you're working with a mentee, 
how can you make sure that you really speak to the exact needs of the person that you're working with, right? You want to speak to that person's particular situation. You want to work in their interests. And that's a similar way that you would go about tutoring or if you are working with a tutor who will be working with your students, make sure that they make an effort to get to know the people that they're working with so that we can get the best results possible at the end. When we think about effective tutoring, so now we're looking a little bit at the difference between tutoring and mentoring. Again, we've already talked about the need to clarify our goals, to provide very good structure, to showcase the resources that we have at our disposal, to train and to mentor the tutor and to help create community. When we talk about training and mentoring the tutor, you also need to think about enabling your tutor to be able to train and mentor the person that they're working with. In the online environment, sometimes we think that our students or our tutors all know how to utilize certain resources online. We know from research that that is not always the case. We should, we should never make these assumptions. So we should always make sure that everybody knows what the technologies are that will be used and how to use them. And then on a regular basis, also checking in with the tutors and with the students to make sure that they know how to utilize the different technologies and the different resources. One way how we can do that is by having a very distinct structure where we continuously check in with everybody and make sure that everybody works toward the same goals. When we think about effective mentoring, of course, it's, it's very similar. So two things that we want to look at here real quick is, on the one hand, when we provide mentorship, what are our articulated goals? What do I want to achieve if I am the mentor? Again, providing very clear structure, showcasing different resources, and then also highlighting best practices. Now, when I am on the receiving end, um, as somebody who is being mentored, I want to, uh, at the same token, identify my own goals. What do I want to get out of it? My mentor might have very specific goals in mind, but what are my personal goals? What do I, what type of skills do I want to hone here? And then think about what is my time investment um, how much effort do I want to invest in this um, from the side of being mentored? Now, we've talked about utilizing technology to improve best practices in tutoring and mentoring. Something that is very important that I cannot stress enough is that technology really needs to enhance the experience. As we mentioned when we talked about backward design, technology um, can certainly provide more flexibility. Um, it can provide more access and it can provide more exposure and practice. So technology really is a resource that can advance language and culture proficiency, but technology is never the goal in and of itself, right? It is just a means to reach our goal. And so we have to make sure that we never put technology first. Um, technology should never be a crutch. Technology ju should just enhance our practices in tutoring and mentoring. And as I already mentioned um, just a moment ago, is that it is really important that all stakeholders need ongoing training in technology use so that we can ensure that they make the best use of technology. And this really is no different from utilizing technology for teaching, for example, right? We should never put the technology first just because we think it is exciting or there is a new app that came out. But we always need to go back and think about what's the pedagogical implication or for mentoring, what's the professional implication and how can technology make our path to um, reaching our objectives a little bit easier. 
So now that we've talked about um, what role technology should play in tutoring and mentoring, let's discuss some resources and platforms that you can help in tutoring and mentoring practices. Of course, one of the first things that comes to mind is uh, utilizing Google Suite. Um, it's free and you have access to a plethora of tools that can help overcome some of these obstacles that we've talked about at the beginning of this lesson. So for example, if you want to provide specific structure and a specific schedule, you can use Google Calendar or any other online calendaring tool for scheduling. You can have shared documents where you figure out what are you going to discuss during any given meeting, what are some of the things that you want um, the tutor or the student who's being tutored or the mentee to think about um, before the next session. So having shared documents where you can also um, utilize voice typing, um, that's a nice feature in, in Google. Um, if you don't want to keep typing out and if you want to practice your target language use, um, you can see how maybe certain words are spelled. Um, you can utilize Google Maps too if you want to dive into the target culture um, and maybe practice on certain functions like giving directions, for example. You can use uh, Google Groups should you ever be in a scenario where it is not a one-on-one -on -one. Um, situation, but where you work with multiple people at the same time. Um, Google Hangouts, of course, Google Classrooms, if you're looking for something like um, a learning management system. So Google has a lot of um, opportunities that you can utilize to share thoughts, share ideas, help structure the entire um, experience. Another tool that you could use is Flipgrid. Um, this is a platform where you can create and share short videos. It's um, somewhat like a storytelling tool. So it's another way where you can allow specifically, um, if you're thinking about tutoring, where you can allow the students to practice speaking, um, gaining more confidence, because if you can record a video online multiple times before you upload it, um, you can practice and you can feel better about your oral output. And also something else that Flipgrid allows is that you can connect with other users around the globe. There's a hashtag called GridPals, and you can see what other people of maybe a similar age are discussing. So I think this is targeting um, more the tutoring side. You certainly could use it for mentoring as well. You could create a repository of um, videos discussing certain topics um, or just as I mentioned before, utilizing it for practice. Um, another obvious resource is to connect um, in, a, in a visual way if you're not in the same location by using Zoom, Skype, FaceTime, any of these services. So if you want to have synchronous conversations, utilizing any of these tools, and usually they are free as well, um, is a nice way also to create community and to build those relationships that we talked about really are the hallmark um, of successful tutoring and mentoring relationships. Some of these features also have a chat feature. Um, so while you are connecting in a synchronous manner and you are speaking real time and you see each other, you can also enhance the experience by typing, by sharing links, by sharing information. And of course, you can have multiple of these resources and platforms open at the same time, right? So you could, at the same time, while you are connecting um, via Zoom, for example, you could also have a Google document open and help you structure what you're talking about, discuss certain aspects. Um, if you're working with a student on improving their writing skills, for example, you can highlight, well, here is um, how you could have rephrased something. So many different ways of actually combining various technologies to make the experience um, more educational. Another resource um, that is particularly helpful for tutoring is conversation guides. 
These are documents that were prepared by the Center for Language Teaching Advancement um, at Michigan State University. And it's a, a set of documents that provide advice on first, how do you find a conversation partner, if that's something um, that's of interest, but then also more importantly, it gives a whole host of suggestions for different topics, for role plays, for situations. So oftentimes something that our students will encounter in um, assessments, in oral proficiency exams, for example, and even taking it a step back, providing students um, and tutors with tips for how can you start a conversation with somebody that you don't know, how can you maintain a conversation. These particular guides are targeting students with intermediate or advanced level proficiency. So they assume that students already have some proficiency, so they would not be very useful for very basic beginning level learners. And right now these documents are available um, in English, and then abridged versions in Arabic, Chinese, French, German, and Spanish. Um, I know that CELTA is currently in the process of redesigning the website. So if you are unable to find these resources, send them a quick email and ask for the um, files or contact me. Um, I used to work at that center and I still have copies of these documents available that I am um, able to share. To summarize what we talked about, what are some of the affordances of blending technology? Why should we utilize technology to enhance our tutoring and mentoring practices? I think one thing that also is important in, in any educational um, environment, we want to diversify what we do, right? If you think about um, meeting with a person, you don't always want to meet on the same day, at the same time, in the same location, right? That will end up with maybe becoming a little bit boring. So if we can diversify our practices, if we can diversify what we do, the tutoring and mentoring experience um, will become more meaningful. And technology can be an important tool for that. We talked about the fact that technology can broaden the scope of what we do. We can expand um, the, the situation just beyond ourself as the person who is providing mentorship or our tutor providing tutoring services to the student. So providing a more diverse access to different resources. Also, we talked about the fact that we can make direct connections with the target language and culture. Through the internet, we have so many things at our fingertips where students can just look at different um, artifacts online. They can connect with museums. Um, so we can make learning more meaningful even without having to travel, literally having to travel to the target culture. Um, technology can also offer more and more flexible opportunities for practice. We had mentioned that we can be more flexible in terms of time, space, and pace. And that's really important for our students um, who might come from different backgrounds, who might have different learning preferences, different learning styles. So just thinking of, of various ways of how we can reach all of the people that we work with when we tutor and also work with um, the people that we mentor. So here are some of the references um, that I mentioned throughout this lesson. If you are interested in learning more about tutoring and mentoring and best practices and technology, some of these um, will be important for you to look at. And I am more than happy to address any questions that you may have. You can always contact me at my email address at acramer at cornell.edu. Good luck with the rest of your lessons, and I hope that this was helpful.